Good morning, everybody. Come on in. Let's get ready to worship. Come on in. So glad you're with us today. You know what? We all ought to give the Lord a hand of praise for that wonderful rain we got last night. Amen. We've needed so badly. It's so good to see you today. You know what? We have victory in Jesus. Can I get an amen in the house? Yeah? Let's pray. We'll begin to worship. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. May you be glorified in this place today. Pray that lives and hearts may be changed today. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Let's stand together and sing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How Satan came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me And I heard about his glory Of his precious words of Tory made the lame to walk again and he caused the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory sing it out oh victory Jesus, my Savior forever, He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing. Yeah, give the Lord a hand of praise. You may be seated. Brother Tracy, are you back there? There he is. Yes, I am. Good morning, folks. We are so excited about this morning to have an opportunity to stir the waters up here in baptism. We've got uh, five people. We've got, actually got a family of four and then one other that is going to be baptized. And so we will do that here in just a second. 
Let me just share with you a verse of scripture back in, um, in the book of Acts, chapter 2. When, the, when they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, and as many as the Lord your, our God will call. And when they, and with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. And so those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 were added to them. Well, we're not going to baptize 3,000 today. We'd be here a little while, but we are going to baptize five of our new people that have done the very same thing here. They have repented and they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so... If you'll kind of start getting over here and get ready and over here as well, we will begin. Come on up, Kinsey. And if y'all want to come on up and kind of sit right around here, the family's all getting baptized today, the whole Kirkland family. Uh, Chris and Stacy and Derek and Kinsey are all getting baptized. Dexter, I'm sorry, Dexter. And Kinsey, we're all getting baptized today, and so we're so excited about that. So, if you'll come on down. Yeah. Yes, they're so glad that the water is warm today. All right, let's go sit down right here. Uh-huh, right there. Miss Kinsey? Miss Kinsey, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? you have and you want to follow him in baptism today all right i baptize you then in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and all the people said Amen. Dexter, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And are you willingly following him today in baptism as proof and as evidence to the people? I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, Stacy. They have made previous professions of faith, but they wanted this to be a family affair today. Uh, they've been in other church, but um, they wanted to do this as in, in obedience to Christ and the sub submersion of the water. And so you have professed your faith in Jesus Christ, and you follow him as your Lord and Savior. Yes. I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Chris, come on down. Chris, I ask you the same question. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And by your evidence here today, you're wanting to follow him in baptism. Yes. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yes. All right, now we have Cheyenne Donaldson coming up. Cheyenne and I had a conversation with her family back months ago, and she was hoping to get baptized. Come on down. Get baptized back on Easter Sunday, but because of everything that happened with COVID, we were not able to do that. But uh, we set up this date today, and she is here today, and she is so excited. And I believe you have some family here, don't you? Family, you want to kind of wave out there, let us know who you are? All right. Got family that's come. Um. They don't actually live here. Y'all live in Waxahachie, right? No? Mansfield. I knew it was one of those over there in the Metroplex. So, but they got married here, her and her, her husband and, and, and the family. So um, they wanted to come back and be a part of this church here for her baptism. As um, We had a chance to talk about that in, our, in my office upstairs. And so, Cheyenne, I ask you, 
Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And today you want to follow him in obedience and baptism. Therefore I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are so grateful for these that have made that profession of faith. And any time that you feel ready to make that acceptance as well, please come at the end of the service and talk with me, David, Brother Jeremy, and we'll be happy to stir the waters again. Amen. All right, Brother David. Amen. That's a beautiful sight. Amen. Let's worship together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship Your The sun comes up, it's the new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Lift him up today. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. I worship your
the Lord. You may be seated for a moment. Today we are partaking of the Lord's Supper. And you know, I, we always want our hearts right, our minds right with the Lord. And as we worship, as we sing, let's surrender it all to the Lord right now. Okay? Let's do that. Say 
blessed Savior, and The Lord's Supper is the name given by the Apostle Paul to the event that commemorated the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And on the night of his betrayal, Jesus instituted the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And this is a time when believers remember what Jesus did for them on Calvary's cross. The bread that we will partake of represents the broken body while the wine symbolizes the blood that he shed on our behalf. Jesus commanded that believers do this in remembrance of him until he returns. And so I've asked some of our deacon brothers to come and to lead us through different portions of the service. Brother Todd. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this holy ordinance and what it represents. We thank you that we can participate in this and remember, remember the sacrifice. Remember what Christ did on the cross for us. Let us never forget what was done out of grace, love, and mercy so that we might have eternal life and salvation. We just pray, dear Lord, that, that uh, we would never, ever take that for granted, but just just know what the Lord went through for us and that, that you love us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. As we partake of this, let us examine ourselves. Let us uh, show us through your Holy Spirit if there's anything that we need to confess before you that we need to lay at your feet, dear Lord. And uh, we want to be worthy as we partake of this. Uh, that we've, we've put everything out there that may come between us at your feet. We thank you for the sacrifice, dear Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As you notice, there are different um, little pieces of plastic, so be sure that you open one at a time as we get to the uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper. I'd also encourage you, if you would like to, to kind of shake it up a little bit. Sometimes the things at the bottom kind of get um, down. Anyway, you might want to shake it up a little bit. So uh, the next part, of course, will be the eating of the of partaking of the bread. Brother Marty, if you'll come and read the scripture and, and then pray and then lead them in the taking of the bread. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. 
On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, you have united us through your Son in one flesh. And as we study, that means more than just our bodies, Father. You have completely absorbed us and made us part of you. Father, we seek as we become more like you to honor you in that flesh, Father. And Father, thank you for the gift of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, who brought us back into union with you. Thank you, Lord of Lords. Amen. Take it. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, Lord. We thank you so much for the sacrifice, for the blood of Jesus Christ, and for the significance of that. Father, thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we need, the only choice we have is Jesus. And Father, we thank you so much for his willingness to give his body on the cross for our sins. Thank you for the blood of Jesus and for the hope that we have because of his sacrifice. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the body that you that bled the blood that you shared may we always be mindful of what you did for us on that cross over 2,000 years ago father may our lives be that living example and living testament each and every day of who you are in our life and may we share that with others around us amen I hope you understand the significance of what we as a body did this morning in celebrating outward expressions of an inward change that Christ has made in our lives. I hope that as you watched those being baptized this morning, you hearkened back to the day that you yourself were baptized. A symbolic gesture showing that you were buried and brought back to life by Jesus. I hope that as you took the elements of the Lord's Supper this morning, that bread, that wine, the juice, that you realized how significant it is that we share in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That we share 
time together with our Lord and Savior. And by simply being a part of these baptisms this morning and being a part of the Lord's Supper this morning, we are unified together and we paint a picture to the lost and dying community around us that we are one. We're going to continue our study in Philippians this morning. And I want you to turn to your Bible. We're going to pick back up in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to read the rest of chapter 1 this morning. Today has already been, before we even open the Word, a significant day for the kingdom of God. The forces of the enemy are pushed back when we are unified. The forces of the enemy are pushed back when we acknowledge before the world the significance of Jesus Christ. The enemy is pushed back when we celebrate that those who once belonged to the kingdom of darkness are now children in the light. Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. This morning I'm reading from the ESV. Paul is writing and he says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some, indeed, preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this... I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. I know I said we were going to finish the chapter this morning. I got a little excited, got a little ahead of myself. We're going to stop right there. You can be seated. Paul had long hoped to take the gospel to Rome. Paul had long hoped to take the gospel to Rome. You can see that in Acts chapter 19 verse 21 or Romans chapter 1 verse 15. We see also that the gospels described the time frame of when Jesus was born and walked the earth. They used a phrase, the fullness of time. Jesus was born in the fullness of time. And what we can discern from that is that the conditions and situations of the world at the time was ripe and perfect for Jesus to come and for the message that he brought. Reconciliation, a restoration between sinful man and a holy God. The situation was ripe for the spread of that. For the first time in history during the time of Jesus, there was primarily one language that united the world. That was Greek. For the first time in the history of the world, the majority of the world was at peace, brought about by the Roman Empire. There was a system of roads that had been developed, the Roman road, that allowed easy travel between all corners of the world. 
That was the fullness of time. And I believe that Paul understood the fullness of time, and he saw the fullness of time as continuing on into his day. He got that if he made it to Rome, the message of Jesus would spread everywhere. That if he could get to Rome, he could get to the world. But there was a problem. He got to Rome, but not the way he wanted. He got to Rome, but not with the circumstances and the situation that he had originally envisioned. He ended up there in prison. Yet despite of that, he remained single-minded, focused on proclaiming the gospel. We see in verse 12 that Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. This morning we're going to look at four main ideas, and I want you to take these ideas and begin to think as you hear them, apply them to your own personal life. I can't make the personal application for each of you because I don't know where each of you are at right now. But I can tell you that there are truths in these passages. And the first is this from verses 12 and 13. We see that God is sovereign over every aspect of your life. God is sovereign over every aspect of your life. What does that mean? When you hear the term, the sovereignty of God, it means that God knows every detail of your life. That He is not caught by surprise by anything that you experience, by anything that you go through, by anything that you think, or by anything that you feel. He knows it all. And more than that, He is taking every hardship in your life, and he is working it for his purposes and for ultimately your good. Now there is great hope and there is great peace in knowing that God is not caught by surprise by any of these things. Right? God was not caught by surprise by COVID. God was not caught by surprise in struggles at school. God was not caught by surprise by anything. He was not caught by surprise when Paul ended up in prison. But Paul had to remind people of this. Keep your hand in Philippians, if you're using a paper Bible, and turn back with me to Acts chapter 21. Here are the circumstances that ultimately ended up putting Paul in prison. Acts chapter 21, we're going to read beginning in verse 8. Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 8. On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who is one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him, that being Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem and be with the believers there for the celebration of Pentecost. Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit came down and indwelt people for the first time. Paul wanted to be there for that celebration. And we see that the same Holy Spirit, he was going to celebrate the coming of 
indwelt this man named Agabus. And Agabus prophesied and said, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you will be put into prison. And Luke, who was writing the book of Acts, said, we, he included himself, Luke and the others, said, Paul, don't go then. Don't go. And Paul said, I'm willing I'm willing to go to jail. I'm willing to be bound. I'm willing to die to go to Jerusalem to commemorate functionally the birth of the church. I'm willing to do that. So Luke and the others backed off and said, let the will of the Lord be done. And ultimately, Paul was bound. And he was jailed. And over the next couple of years, he went from jail to jail and eventually found himself in Rome. Paul's intention was not to be jailed in Rome. And he had to remind the people of the circumstances leading to his imprisonment. And that circumstances, him being in prison, was really an opportunity given by God to share the gospel. The entire imperial guard, verse 13, the entire praetorian guard heard the gospel because Paul was in jail. Now, how many people are we talking about? Under Augustus, who was the Roman emperor at the time of the birth of Jesus, the praetorian guard was about 6,000 people. And by the time you get to Emperor Nero, who was emperor when we believe Paul eventually was killed, it was close to 10,000. So Paul is saying that 10,000 people, between 6 and 10, go conservative 6,000, go on the far end 10,000, between 6 and 10,000 people have heard the name of Jesus, have heard the message of Jesus, has heard the gospel of Jesus because I was put in jail. Now I'll tell you what, I don't think that in Paul's desire to go to Rome, his first target group of people were going to be soldiers. I don't think he ever envisioned when he went to Rome that he was going to start off his ministry with Roman soldiers. If he followed on what he did earlier in the book of Acts, he was going to target people that already had a belief in God. We talked about this a few weeks ago, like Lydia. He would not have targeted the soldiers. But he understood that it had become known through the whole imperial guard and to the rest, more than that even, that the reason he was in jail was because of Jesus. Now, I don't believe for a second that the entire imperial guard each took turns guarding Paul. He was not that significant of a prisoner in Roman eyes. He was not a troublemaker. He was not an insurrectionist. He was not trying to overthrow Rome. So how is it then that the entire imperial guard heard about this message? Paul talked. People visited. Timothy came and saw him. We, we established last week that Epaphroditus had brought some food and some money for Paul's stay in prison. And as Paul talked and he shared Jesus with these soldiers, soldiers talked to each other. And they began to spread the message. They began to share. You know, this Paul guy, he's kind of unique. He's kind of interesting. He says he's in jail because of this. God was sovereign over Paul's imprisonment. It did not take him by surprise. Now, how many of you have ever been taken by surprise in your life? Every hand, every hand should go up twice. About two years ago, a little over two years ago, uh, June of 2018, and this is just a personal reflection. Uh, we, my family and I, we came back to the States from Asia, where we had spent uh, almost, almost 15 years. We came back from Asia, and we had come back with the intention 
of staying in the U.S. for no more than six months. And over the next few months, by October of 2018, it became clear that the door we had for effective ministry in Asia had closed. And that we were not going to be able to go back in a way that we had ever been before. And by January, uh, it was really, really clear that we could never go back and live. So for about six months, for about six months, I was in limbo. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know where I was supposed to go. And I was hurt. I was sad. I was mourning for the loss of a ministry among a people group that really had only been exposed to the gospel for less than 70 years total. Prior to that, they had no gospel witness. And I found myself questioning, what are we supposed to do? And I remember very vividly, Trish and I sitting together, and I don't normally verbally process things. I don't normally talk a whole lot out loud and just kind of do this stream of consciousness, here's everything in my head thing. But that night, that night I remember very vividly just talking to Trish and I said, what can we ever do that will have as much impact for the kingdom as what we've done the past 14 years? I could not envision at that moment in time, anything, anything more significant for the kingdom of God and the spread of the gospel than what we had been doing. Yet God is sovereign over every aspect of our lives, right? I wasn't resting in that. I was spending too much time looking backwards, looking at how God had worked, not looking forward as to how God was going to work. And what I needed in my life at that moment in time leads us into the second point, verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Here is something that's important. This is our second point tonight, this morning. To remember, models of faithfulness and boldness help create more faithfulness and boldness. We need good examples in our life. When people are in the midst of a hardship and we see their joy and their faithfulness because they're resting in the sovereignty of God, they become more bold and that emboldens us. Because the believers in Rome and then the believers in Philippi, when they read this letter, because they saw and heard Paul rejoicing at what God was doing and what he was going to do, Rather than sulking and griping, complaining at what God didn't do, they could rejoice knowing that all things work together for his glory and for those who are called according to his purpose. Hear that again. Paul rejoiced in prison. Paul was bold in prison. What were they going to do? Kill him? We get to that a little bit later in the letter, right? Paul was bold, and because he was bold, others were bold. At that moment, kind of that crisis moment in our lives, where everything that we had prepared for and planned for and worked for had seemingly been taken away from us, we needed somebody bold to come alongside us and say, God's got this. And I don't know where you're at or what you're going through this morning, but hear this. God has it. God has it. He has got it under control. And you may not be able to see it, and you may doubt it, but God has it under control. Bold Christianity is contagious. Bold Christianity is contagious like a virus. We all probably know way more virus-type vocabulary than we did about a year ago, 
right? I know I do. Bold Christianity is contagious. Joyous Christianity is contagious. Do you know people in your life that even when things are hard, they still reflect the joy that Christ brings them? To some people that comes naturally. But do you know who gives me the most encouragement? People that I've spent time with in my life, and I know they are not naturally joyous. They have to fight for it. They have to work for it. Because I myself am not that person. I am not the person who is naturally just happy and bubbly all the time. I don't know if anybody you thought that. Probably not. But that is not who I am. I have to fight for my joy on a weekly and daily basis. And I know there are those of you out here that have to fight for joy too because circumstances will pound and pound and pound and knock you down. But our joy is not found in circumstances. Our joy is found in the Lord. So when you are down... And I believe Paul was speaking to the Philippians because he realized they were down. He reminded them that being bold engenders and creates boldness. That joyous Christianity is contagious. That asymptomatic Christianity, there's a virus word, right? Asymptomatic. Asymptomatic Christianity does not lead to community spread. Did you hear that? Asymptomatic Christianity, meaning that nothing in your life reflects that Christ is in you, will not spread the gospel. So you need to ask yourself this morning, am I a contagious Christian or am I asymptomatic? That's a hard truth, right? Because some days when we allow circumstances to beat us up, we appear asymptomatic. Bold Christianity will be contagious. I love verse 14 because Paul says, And most of the brothers, most of them, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word, and not just speak the word, but speak it without fear. These were guys that were not in jail, that were not in prison, and they were emboldened to spread the gospel because they saw Paul doing it in the worst of circumstances. And when you see someone's faith come alive, and testify to who Jesus really is, when they are in the worst of circumstances, that should push us and propel us and motivate us to go out and do the same. I'll share with you the story of a, of a believer over in Asia. We called him Timothy. His real name, again, you couldn't pronounce. You wouldn't remember it if I said it. And when he became a believer, this man, a couple of years older than myself, when he became a believer on his mud-packed home that was made with mud and straw, you could see the straw in each of the mud bricks that he had fashioned. He fashioned a cross made out of mud. He set it in a mold that he built. He had a heart around the cross with light rays emanating from the cross and the heart. And he put that up on his house. And he said, this will be a symbol, a beacon to everybody around that my life finds its meaning, that my life finds its meaning in the one who died for me on that cross. Now this is in a nation where symbols like that are frowned upon. He put a target on his own back by putting that on his house. And you couldn't avoid seeing it. He lived at the front end of a village. You had to pass his house to get to the rest of the homes. And everybody who walked past his house, 
for the next 10 years asked him those questions. What is that about? Gospel presentation. Immediately, he was bold. Now, he was persecuted by the government. He had been arrested. He had been harassed by police. And he said, I will not take that down. I will be bold. And do you know what it did? Other people began to see this boldness. And they began to see that he was living out his life differently than he had before. And then they began to come to him and not ask him questions about what does that symbol mean? But they began to ask him questions. Why are you different? Well, let me tell you why I'm different, he said. I'm different because of Jesus. And more and more people came to faith because of his boldness. Bold Christianity is contagious. And I want to encourage you this morning, be bold. When we really think and understand what Jesus has done for us, that should come out. It should come out in our conversations. It should come out in what we watch. It should come out in what we listen to. It should come out in how we spend our time. Be bold. But you say, Jeremy, I, I try to be bold, and I'm not perfect. I know, none of us are. So when we, when we make mistakes, what do we do? When we mess up, what do we do? We confess. We confess our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. We confess our sins one to another. That's biblical. And we get help from each other. Not only is bold Christianity contagious, but bold Christianity helps our brothers and sisters who are struggling. And that might be you this morning. But something else is going on here. And you get the sense when we read this that it kind of bothers Paul a little bit. Verse 15 through 18. <clears throat> Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. There was a problem. There was a problem. There were those that opposed Paul. They were still preaching Jesus, but they opposed Paul. Now, if you look at the other letters Paul wrote, if you look at Galatians, for example, if these people who opposed Paul were openly heretical, if they were openly denying the truths of Jesus, Paul would have called them like he did at Galatia. But that's not what's going on here. This was a group of believers in Rome who, verse 15 says, preached Christ. In verse 17, he says, they proclaimed Christ. Now, he assigns a motivation to them, but they were preaching Christ and they were proclaiming Christ. So what's really going on here? There were people that thought Paul had done great damage to the kingdom of God by allowing himself to be arrested. Remember, we read that passage back in Acts 21. I believe that these guys thought that Paul had foolishly hurt the cause of Christ by getting arrested. Right? Because that prophet came to him and said, this is what's going to happen. And Paul basically said, come on, bring it. They thought that Paul had foolishly hurt the spread of the gospel. Can you believe how foolish Paul was. 
He was told by the Holy Spirit that he was going to get arrested. How many more people could Paul have reached with the gospel had he not got himself in trouble? Can you hear that? I can hear that. They began to puff themselves up at the expense of Paul. I, I never would have got myself arrested. I haven't been arrested. Look, I'm out here proclaiming the gospel. I stayed out of jail. What's wrong with Paul? Why couldn't he have stayed out of jail? They built their own ministry by trashing somebody else. And this is an ancient problem. If you look back at the book of Job, you see kind of the same thing going on. Job was being tested. God knew everything that was going on. He's sovereign. And he allowed Job to be tested. And then Job's holy, righteous friends come and they begin to question Job. Job, surely you must have unconfessed sin in your life, otherwise you wouldn't be going through all this. And Job said, I'm... I'm innocent. Yeah, but if you just confess, I mean, if I was in your position, I would confess. That's not a new problem. And that problem carries on to today. All we see of these men is that their motivation was envy and rivalry. Paul did not allow these men to steal his joy. He did not allow these men to define his worth or value in the kingdom of God or the mission of all believers. Paul did not allow those guys preaching out of rivalry or suspicion to take that from him. Paul defined his worth on how Jesus saw him. Paul defined his worth on the mission that Jesus had given him. And he's given it to all of us, by the way, and that is the spread of the gospel. Rivalry, division, and strife, and this is really the summary statement for the third point. Rivalry, division, and strife do not define you, your ministry, or your church. Rivalry, division, and strife does not define you. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It simply means that it doesn't define who you are, and it does not define this church. Do you believe that? Division, rivalry, and strife does not define, has not defined, and will not define the lighthouse on the lake. Rivalry, division, and strife will not define future ministry here in this community and overseas. What defines the ministry of Lake Fork Baptist Church is who we celebrated today in baptism and the Lord's Supper, and that is the person solely of Jesus Christ. When there is rivalry, when there is division, and when there is strife, Look to Jesus. Because so often, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, so often when we begin to to not get along with people, when we begin to see that we're a little bit less patient with somebody than we were a year ago or two years ago or five years ago, It's because we have taken our eyes off of Jesus and turned them on something else. What we must do to combat this type of situation is exactly what Paul did. Teach, preach the gospel, and allow the gospel to transform us from the inside out. No division, no rivalry, no strife, no arguments will define who you are. Because church, if you are a believer, you are in Christ. That is your identity. 
You are in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're old. It doesn't matter if you're young. If you've been a believer for a day. If you've been a believer for a decade or 50 years. If you're black. If you're white. If you speak English. If you speak Spanish. If you speak Asian languages. If you can read. If you cannot. If you're rich. If you're poor. If you have great family relationships and were brought up with a moral standard, or if you were raised without parents, none of that matters because at the foot of the cross, we are all equal. And every problem that could possibly come up is solved at the foot of the cross. Every problem that we have is solved at the foot of the cross. Point number four, a life lived with purpose can find joy and peace in all circumstances. A life lived with purpose can find joy and peace in all circumstances. What was Paul's purpose? Paul's purpose was to see the spread of the gospel and the building up of the saints to the glory of Jesus Christ. I began to use an illustration earlier from my own life about me asking God and wondering from God, what could I ever do that was as significant as what we did in Asia? I was asking the wrong question. I was asking the wrong question. Because do you know what didn't change from Asia to Texas for me? My life's purpose. It didn't change. The geography changed, but my purpose didn't change. Why was I in Asia to start with? For the spread of the gospel and the building up of the saints to the glory of Jesus Christ. Why is that any different than here in East Texas? The the answer to that question is, it's not. My life's purpose here is for the spread of the gospel and the building up of the saints to the glory of Jesus Christ. And you know what's great about being here in Texas? I can speak English again. I am not going to lie to you. For 15 years, having conversations like this in another language, my second language or my third language, was hard on my brain. And it has been a great blessing and nice to be able to speak English again. It allows me to go deeper in relationship quicker than what I could in Asia. So I began the process of finding joy and peace in a circumstance that I did not expect being back here. And we began to see the sovereignty of God speak into us, to see that in our lives. When we saw my parents begin to get sick and their health begin to fail, we were here for that. I could give you a thousand examples of how I've seen the sovereignty of God work in my life. How I've seen His hand. And I think if you spend maybe even just a cursory two or three minutes, you could find examples in your life where God worked things together even though you didn't see it at the time. Paul lived his life knowing that God had His hand on him. Paul lived his life with a purpose, and that allowed him to find joy and peace even in prison. It allowed him to find joy and peace and to not bring shame on the name of Jesus. That was Paul's greatest fear. It's not that he was going to be killed. His greatest fear, verse 20. Well, go back to verse 19. For I know that through your prayers... And the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. 
Paul did not want to tarnish the name or the reputation of Jesus because he knew that if he did, it would impact people's receptivity to the gospel. He didn't want Jesus to look down on him with disdain. This is Paul who was blinded by the appearance of the Lord. Go back into the book of Acts. We see how Paul came to be a believer of Jesus. Paul had been a great persecutor of the church. He sought out followers of the way. He sought out Christians, had them beaten, had them killed. And Paul himself is on a road one day and he is stricken blind. And he hears a voice. They use his Hebrew, God uses Hebrew name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul already knew what it meant. He already knew what it meant to bring shame on himself. And yet God forgave him of that. God forgave him of the persecution of Christians, of murder. Go back to the book of Acts again in Acts uh, 7. And you see Stephen being stoned and Paul's there. He watches all this happen. Paul did not want to tarnish the name of Jesus. So if he was to die, he was to die. If he was to live, he was going to live. But he was not going to get into an argument with these guys that preached out of rivalry. Because he knew that would damage the reputation of the church. To die, verse 21, this is a verse that, that you probably know, that you probably have memorized. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This verse, and the verses immediately following it, is kind of Paul processing out loud, in written form, what he's thinking. If I die, I get to be with Jesus. If I live, it means that I get to continue ministry. For if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I don't know which, what I'm going to do. And then he continues. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. Nobody's going to argue that. Nobody is going to argue that leaving this life and being with Jesus is far better. We have verse after verse after verse in the New Testament that tells us what that is going to be like. Don't you long for the day when there are no more tears. I do. Don't you long for the day when there's no more pain. When there's no more suffering. Nobody is arguing that to depart this world and to be with Christ is a far, far better thing. But here, in this next section of Scripture, we see Paul's purpose in life. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. But to remain in the flesh, Paul, who was driven by a deep personal relationship with Jesus, who understood his purpose to be the spread of the gospel and the building up of the saints, he says, for me to remain is more necessary. Why? Why is it more necessary? Because you have not yet been brought to maturity in Christ. And you need help. Paul knew that to fulfill his life's purpose, he needed to stay. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this. See, this is that, that internal dialogue that Paul has written down for us. I want to leave, but I'm convinced that staying, 
I know I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. Paul wanted to stay so that he could help foster growth in the life of the believer. Paul wanted to stay so that he could help the church at Rome, the church at Philippi, the church in other places grow in their joy, knowledge, and relationship with Jesus. He was convinced that he should live so more and more people would know Jesus, would see a tangible example of what it is to follow Jesus. And we're presented with the same question today. We long for Jesus' return. We sang about it last week. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We long for Jesus' return. And we kind of do what Paul does sometimes. Hasten the day, right? Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Because this world is hard. It is agonizing. It is full of pain. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. How much worse is it going to have to get before Jesus comes back? How many of you have ever asked that question? Yet we're faced with what Paul was faced. We can pray, Lord Jesus, come back, or take me out of this world, Lord. I can't stand it anymore. We can do that. And there is no prohibition against praying that. We can pray that seven or eight times a day. But we need to look at the flip side of that too. If Jesus comes back in the next 20 minutes, we will celebrate, right? Come on guys, this isn't a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you, I'm really not. I know that I use a lot of those rhetorical devices and it appears that I'm trying to trick you. I'm not. If Jesus comes back in the next 20 minutes, we're going to rejoice, right? And there will be no regrets when he returns. However, here's the trick. You guys knew it was coming, right? <clears throat> if we knew, if we knew that Jesus returned in the next 20 minutes, how would we best spend that 20 minutes? You better go out and you better share with your neighbor that you know that doesn't know Jesus, or you better share with your mother or your father or your sister or your brother who doesn't know Jesus, you better get out there and share the gospel. So this is what we're faced with. We long and hope for the return of Jesus, but every moment that he delays is a moment and an opportunity that we have to spread the good news of salvation through him alone. To die is gain, but for us to live is Christ. We have an opportunity in however many days, hours, or moments we have to share the gospel with the people around us. There were many, many days in Asia that I asked the Lord to delay coming back. Because I didn't want the people that I was surrounded by on a daily basis to be eternally separated from Him. And that's not inconsistent. On the surface, it appears to be contradictory, right? Lord Jesus, come quickly. Jesus, delay. It appears contradictory, but when you are praying to the Lord, the creator of the universe, out of right motives, out of the motive that you are burdened for the lostness that is around you, the come quickly and the delay, he understands your heart. He understands your motivation.
God is sovereign. He alone can answer that question, how bad is it going to have to get before he returns? He already knows. He's not waiting. He's not waiting to see how bad it's going to get. Oh, I wonder what those people down there can do now. He's not wondering that. He knows there is a fixed time when Jesus returns, period. God is sovereign over every detail of your life. When we lose sight of that, we need people in our lives. We need the church. We need each other to push us forward, to press us on toward that goal of maturity in Christ, to be bold, to be faithful. When we are distracted by rivalry or envy or division, it doesn't detract from our ministry. It doesn't define who we are. It doesn't define the church. We press forward. Because we can live a life of purpose. And when we live that life of purpose, we have joy and peace in all circumstances. It doesn't mean that we don't mourn. It doesn't mean that we don't look back and say, could I have done something different? But we live our life with joy and peace in all circumstances. Paul wrote that from prison. If anybody had a reason to be down, it was him. But he didn't. What he does in this first chapter of Philippians and what he does in almost every statement and letter he writes, when there is a problem, whether it's personal, whether it's a corporate problem, a body of believer problem, when there is an issue, Paul refocuses our eyes on Jesus. There is no better way to refocus our eyes on Jesus than what we did this morning when we took the Lord's Supper. There is no greater testimony of unity in Christ than when we eat and fellowship together. So here are your questions. Do you know and understand that God is sovereign over every detail of your life? And do you trust Him in the hard times? Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're struggling tonight. Why do I keep saying tonight? Maybe you are struggling in seeing God at work in your life right now. If you are, and we're, we're moving into this time of invitation, I encourage you, come up and kneel at the altar. And simply acknowledge before God, God, I'm having a hard time right now. I don't see how you're working. But then acknowledge before Him what you know in your heart to be true. Even though I don't see you at work, God, I know and believe that you are. Focus. Shift your focus from yourself to Him. Maybe you need somebody to model for you faithfulness, joy, boldness. And you already know who that person is. Go up to them today. Even during the time of invitation, go up to them and say, I see Christ in you. Can you show me why you are the way that you are? Why you're bold? Why you have joy? Why you have faithfulness? No Christian is meant to walk this life alone. By the way, that's why nobody has all the gifts. The New Testament says there are spiritual gifts. Nobody has them all. Maybe you've been wrapped up in some strife, some rivalry, some division, and you've let that define who you are. Don't. If you are in Christ, He defines who you are. And if you find that there has been some of that in your life, make it right with that person. 
Ask the Lord to give you the words to say. And ultimately, I want you to ask yourself, are you living a life of purpose? Are you living a life with purpose? Not just here, but in the the last words of Jesus in the book of Matthew. What does he say? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. That is our purpose. That was not a directive just given to the 11, the 12 minus Judas. It was not a command just given to them. It was a command to us. A life lived with purpose shares the gospel and builds up the body, builds up the saints. And that's a lifelong process, right? Are you living your life with purpose? If you are, then you can find joy and peace no matter what. I will confess to you this morning that there are a lot of distractions in my life. Does anybody have distractions in their life? One of them's in my pocket. It's the phone. There's distractions abound. And sometimes I don't live my life as if I'm living with the purpose God created me for. And if you find that that's you this morning, again, I would encourage you, come to the altar. Pray. Pray. Come talk to David. Come talk to Tracy. Come talk to me. We're going to be here. Talk to one of your deacons. They're going to be here. Live your life with purpose. Live your life with purpose. Because everything that is working in and on your life right now, God knows it. He understands it even when we don't. Live your life with purpose. So that on that day, when Jesus does return, you are not found ashamed of what you're doing. You are found doing what He has commanded. I tell my kids, I would love to catch you doing something right. Usually, Usually I don't say it that calmly. I would love to catch you doing something right. I would love to walk into your room and see you being kind to your brother. I would love to walk into the room and see you cleaning up like I asked you to. And I think, man, when Jesus comes back, I want to be found doing something right. I want to be found doing something right. I want to live my life with the purpose that God has created for me. And I want that for you too. Individually and corporately as Lake Fork Baptist Church, when Jesus returns, I want him to see the lighthouse on the lake doing what it's supposed to do. And the only way that happens, the only way that works, is if we help each other. That's the only way it works. So allow the Lord to speak to you. I'm going to pray. We're going to have a song of invitation. Allow the Lord to speak to you. You come and you talk to Him this morning. And if there's something that you need to to talk about with us or to make public, we want you to do that this morning. We want you to do that. We want to help you. Live your life with purpose. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, you give us more grace daily than we deserve. We know and we confess and acknowledge before you that you 
are sovereign over every detail of our lives. When we doubt, forgive us. Give us the vision to see you in all things. Work in our hearts, work in our lives. Press us forward toward that goal. Give us boldness to share your message with others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. to him. We still have some people praying at the front, so we certainly do not want to disturb that as they're dealing with God or as God is dealing with them and they're just responding back to Him. But we are certainly thankful for you that have come, been a part of our service here today. Just 
want to remind you about some of the um, various activities and things that you read in the bulletin. Be sure to be aware of those things uh, that we have posted there. I'll not take time to go through those, but I hope you will read those and make a point to be involved in some of the different activities and events that we have going on. Brother Todd, if you would, come and close us in prayer. Just a reminder that the deacons will be having a meeting this evening. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time of worship. Uh, we, and we thank you for the message that you've brought us through Brother Jeremy. Uh, we just uh, thank you that you're sovereign, that you have a plan for each of us. Uh, and because you're sovereign, dear Lord, we want to seek your will in everything that we do. Just help us to seek your will and to pray about what you want us to do to further your kingdom. Uh, we just ask, dear Lord, that you give us boldness, uh, that the, the words today, uh, that they don't stay contained in this building, but that uh, you would give us opportunities to share our faith and uh, personally with others and what you've done for us in each of our lives. We just ask that you'd help us, dear Lord, through your spirit to be faithful and obedient. Uh, we, we thank you that you've given us a purpose and a hope through the blood of Jesus. And we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen.